The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Doug Hinton, please. So I'm going to talk about reducing carbon footprint using things that we have at our, in our toolbox already. Supplementary cementitious materials, limestone blended cements, and uh, optimizing aggregate gradations, which is thing, something I don't think we pay nearly enough attention to in North America, but they do in other parts of the world. Okay. So I think this is probably old news for this session, but Portland cement, the biggest issue here is we were calcining limestone, so we were driving off CO2, just taking apart the rock, and we can't avoid that because all our cement, Portland cement systems are calcium silicate based and the only sources of calcium we have are typically tied to carbonates. Um, so we can't, we can make the system more efficient in terms of more efficient kilns, and the industry's done that. And they've reached about their maximum thermal efficiency, but now the only way to take things further is to reduce the clinker content in the cement. And again, there's some numbers, and people would argue about these different numbers, about CO2 emissions, about energy, global energy use, and just general numbers about this. Um, but again, cement's only one component in concrete, but it makes up about 90% of the carbon footprint of concrete, assuming that Portland cement's the sole building uh, binding material in the, in the concrete mixture. So there's no right single answer to get the right place, but we can do a whole bunch of things at the same time. And that's what I want to talk about, that you can optimize aggregations to get more aggregate into the concrete, reduce the cement paste fraction, which reduces your clinker content, through the, and you can use um, water-reducing admixtures efficiently, um, various forms to get the water content down again, reducing the paste fraction of the concrete. We can use limestone cements. The Type 1L C595 allows 15% replacement of clinker with, with lime, interground limestone, and that directly reduces the CO2 emission per kilo or pound of cement by 10%, and using supplementary cementitious materials wisely. And you can do all these things at once. It turns out that limestone cements and, and supplementary cementitious materials get along great. SEMs actually respond better to limestone cements than straight Portland cement because of the they form carboaluminates. So you actually get enhanced properties if you use a limestone cement with SEMs at the same level you're using. So it's not like you're training one against the other. So you can increase the efficiency by doing both of them at the same time. And again, here's the option, you know, just schematically, different SEMs you can use and the different cement types you can use, either blended cements or limestone cements, the type 1Ls, and a 1T in 595 is SEMs plus limestone together. So we want to reduce the clinker content of the binder itself, which is the SEMs and the, and the limestone. And we want to reduce the total binder content, which is by optimizing aggregations and reducing the unit water content of the concrete to get a workable concrete. More cement's not always better, who knew? Um, at a fixed water cement ratio, more cement raises the unit water content of the mix. More pounds per, per cubic yard of water into the mix, which means you have at a given water cement ratio, you need more cement. So if you can reduce the unit water content by using optimizing air gradations and using water reducers appropriately, you can reduce the unit water content. Therefore, at a given water cement ratio, say 0.4 or whatever your requirement is, you can reduce the total cementitious content. Because we can do these separately now. Thanks to admixtures, we can control the unit water content independently of, of water cement ratio. And that's something a lot of design engineers don't seem to realize. They think if you lower the water cement ratio, you get lower slope or something like that. But there's a, you can do these things independently. And one of the problems with our aggregate specs, ASTM specs, the Canadian spec, number of DOT specs, is they haven't been changed for 100 years. You've got gradation envelopes for fine aggregate, you've got gradation envelopes for coarse aggregate, and there's a gap in the middle. And most plants have two bins, fine aggregate, coarse aggregate. You go to other parts of the world, They've got six bins, it's zero to two millimeter, two to four millimeter, four to eight, eight to 16, 16 up. And it's, it's the same in, in Asia, it's the same in, in Europe. The people are really sloppy about this is North America. There's some states where the people have changed that in some urban areas where they've modified this. But for the lack of a few bins, you're putting a lot more of the expensive cement in the system and a lot more CO2 in the environment at the expense of not paying for a bin to put an extra size of aggregate in to get a better gradation 
which seems like uh, a crazy notion. But we do it. And there's just a typical, I mean, it's, that's the Canadian one out of the design and control book. You can take the ASTM version of it. So you have a gradation for fine aggregate, you get a gradation for coarse aggregate, and right where they meet, if you put those together, there's a gap, there's a bump in the curve, the combined curve. And just something simple like using an intermediate material, you can, you can take care of that gap. And a lot of times, that intermediate material is the stuff that got sieved out of creating the coarse aggregate of crusher. It got sieved out to meet the individual coarse aggregate gradient retirement, and it ends up as a secondary chip or, or a screening material instead of being used as coarse aggregate. It's exactly the same properties of the material, but it just didn't fit the size gradation for these pigeonholes we have for the aggregate. And if we want to prevent that, if you have the two pigeonholes, like I say, you've got the blue line, you've got a gap, you've got a fine a bunch of fine material, a bunch of coarse material, and a gap in the middle, and what we want is something more like the red material. And if you fill that in with an intermediate step, you can take care of that and get more aggregate volume in, get better packing. And this is just one example. This is the haystack curve uh, that some people use. There's this 818 distribution uh, some people use. There's the coarseness factor chart. Various people have ways of optimizing. It's not new material, but it's amazing how little effort gets put into this. I've tried to do it. I'm sorry, it's not the best graph, but if you look at the blue, the blue envelope there, that's what happens if you take a standard fine aggregate and a coarse aggregate envelope and stick them together. There's that bump in the middle that I've circled there. Put an intermediate material and you can bring the stuff out and get rid of that gap graded mix, which is typically in the quarter inch, one or two millimeters up to quarter inch size. Now, we did something about this in the Canadian standard in 2014. We now allow, it's the first change in the aggregate spec since 1929. So far back it goes. I don't think it's much different in C33. In C, uh, C we now allow the opportunity to, to create a combined aggregate gradation, fine, including fine and coarse materials, that have to, has to include at least three separate components. You can't jerk around with a couple of off-spec fine and coarse aggregates. You have to bring in a third material and uh, do an optimization process. And we, in terms of testing, we just divide it on the five millimeter or quarter inch sieve. Anything larger than a quarter is coarse aggregate, anything smaller than a quarter is fine aggregate in terms of evaluating the materials for the other tests that we do for aggregate. And you can use more than three materials and we can microfines in. I mean, self-consolidating concrete is exactly what they're doing. To make self-consolidating concrete, you need an optimized gradation curve to get, so you don't get a segregation, a mix that segregates and you want more fines in. But for normal concrete, we could be doing this and saving a lot. Of course, the other thing we have to check is the workability. Um, as well as there's no point packing it in if you can't make workable concrete. And this is just an example from one of my students' work where we, we took the two mixes. So the term, mix on the left is a typical mix we would use for um, uh, 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 bridge deck concrete, 360 kgs, I can't remember what that is in pounds, sorry, which is a type one cement with 25% slag replacement. And the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right is we put the, the limestone screenings in from the same quarry that the coarse aggregate came out of and made up that gap. And now we can reduce the total cementitious material to 330, but, so 10% reduction. And I measured the water, so with the, all they're all standard water reducer, standard air and training agent, and then we use medium range water reducers to figure out the dose rate to get an equivalent slump. And you can see there that there's almost no difference in the medium range water reducer dose required there. Yet our strengths go up by about 10 megapascals, about 1,500 psi. The shrinkage goes down because you're getting more aggregate in. The biggest contributor to drying shrinkage is the volume of aggregate. You increase the volume of aggregate shrinkage goes down. Same thing with rapid applied permeability. The, the permeability is occurring through the paste fraction. Reduce the paste fraction, reduce the permeability. So you can do this to get higher strength concrete, less permeability, lower shrinkage, and less cement at the same time, at the same workability. And again, this is just a schematic. It was Mike Thomas's schematic, but some of the work we, we, we reduced the cement contents by about 15% and still see the benefit of equivalent workabilities. And of course, particle packing, you're, a lot of times the particle programs are pretty simplistic. They assume spherical particles. But, and of course, there's shape issues, there's um, angularity issues, and surface texture issues that affect that. And there's some general trends here. Um, but then it gets more complex to model that. But generally, you can do it on a, um, a trial and error basis for the given materials you've got. Okay. And just some examples again. We were able to reduce the cement by 16% in 
in a 50 MPA or 7250 PSI bridge tech mix um, while meeting a thousand coulomb requirement at 56 days. Um, and we got an 8% reduction in a 35 MPA mix, um, which is what, 5,000 PSI? Um, again, meeting a 1,500 coulomb at uh, 56 day requirement, which is what we have in the Canadian standards for um, extended service life and, and chloride exposures. We use the rapid chloride. What was at 56 is now 90 days. And this was use of an intermediate size coarse aggregate. Again, the screenings from the same quarry as the coarse aggregate to fill that gap. Stuff that is being sold for a lot less money because it doesn't meet a size requirement. Okay. So that's one thing we can do. So we can reduce, reduce the paste volume. Now we can reduce the <coughs> amount of cement in the paste. And that's where the limestone commit comes in. Um, I mean, it's old news now. 595 has this 1L cement. It's been around, I'm thinking, five, six years now. Um, it's, been, it's been around for 10 years in Canada, the equivalent type. Or the GUL. And as I said, these things work well together because they form carboaluminates. The carbonates from the calcium carbonate, interground carbonate, react with the aluminates in the cement. They also react really well with the aluminates in fly ash or slag to form more carboaluminates, and you actually get enhanced one day strength at the same SEM replacement with the limestone cement. And it, not only do you reduce less, uh, you can reduce the CO2 uh, footprint of the cement produced by about 10%. It also reduces the amount of limestone you need to quarry because you're not setting half of it up into the air as CO2 gas. So you can actually extend the life of the quarry at the cement plant. And it reduces the energy consumption as well to produce cement. So there's a whole bunch of good things that are obtained by using the limestone cement. The, um, and the way we've designed the Canadian standard and the ASTM 595 is the physical requirements are exactly the same. Setting time requirements, one day, your strength development curves are exactly the same. So to the user, it should be transparent. You shouldn't be able to see one or the other for any negative effect of using limestone cement. So it's a bit different than the way the Europeans approach the SEM2ALs, where they use up to 20% limestone, but they only, their only equivalency is at 28 days. We say, no, everything's got to be the same, right? Through whatever strength requirements have to be the same. And so the, the companies optimize their systems with the limestone cements to get equivalent performance. So you're not suffering anything from it, just reducing the CO2 burden. Um, and again, they work well with SCMs. Now, just as an example, we just did some mixes. These are 0 0.40 water cement ratio mixes. So a typical type 1 mix with no SCMs, got about 89% clinker in the binder. Um, and you can see the strength development curve from 7 to, uh, days to 6 months. And if we say put 40% slag in, um, I highlighted there at 28 days, 46.2 MPA. Um, and if we go down to the 1L cement with 15% um, limestone and 40% slag, we've got 52 MPA at, at 28 days. And we've got 5 MPA higher, about 1,000 PSA higher at, um, at even 7 days. So we see that equivalent, much reduced clinker fraction. So we're down to, with that mix, 40% slag, 46% clinker. Um, uh, uh, fraction in, in the paste, in the cement materials. And just to show that you don't lose anything on the permeability side, it's exactly the same data, but the rapid chloride permeability limits, the Coulomb limits, again showing a reduction in cou Coulombs at those same mixes, even though you're reducing the, the clinker component in the concrete. And I'll give you one example. We've done a lot of, you know, it's, it's in pretty common use across Canada now in a number of states. I think to be correct, the last time I heard 27 states allow limestone cements, the 1L cements now. But this is just a barrier wall we did nine years ago. And we did truckloads on a barrier on an on a, um, interstate highway, or the equivalent of an interstate in Canada. And we did a whole bunch of testing on it, which is why I thought I'd show it. So it's just a, a barrier, a high, high barrier wall, a transition. Concrete looks like concrete, whether it is GU or GUL. Um, and again, it was three truckloads of each mix, a 30 MPA, a 4,500 PSI mix, looking at um, three, uh, three to four inch slump. And just to show you, again, this is the two mixes, the limestone cement on the right, the straight Portland on the left, with the same slag equivalency, 
Um, the mixes were nominally identical except for the cement that we put into it. You can see the shrinkage is identical, drying shrinkage, that's seven day wet followed by 28 day dry as per 157. You can see the strength development curves even at one day. They're, it's essentially the same right through one day to 90 days. Freeze thaw performance in terms of 666 durability, exactly the same. The de-icer scaling, this is the, our highway department's version of the 672 scaling test measuring mass loss. No difference in mass loss. Um, and the Coulomb value, as you can see, actually we've got reductions in the Coulomb values at 28 and 56 days. So truck, truck mix, this is one of the first ones they did to the highway department. And since then, oh sorry, here's some more data. Um, this is, the highway department did their own scaling tests and we did our scaling tests. We didn't see a difference. They saw a slight difference. But in the field that after nine years, there's not seeing any difference in the field in terms of performance. And our highway department um, has been doing a number of tests and since I think 2012. All the cements uh, that are produced with limestone cements are now on their approved sources list. And, um, and they're being used commercially all over the place. So we can optimize concrete just using fairly simple tools that we have are available now. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, by optimizing aggregations um, to get, uh, with, an, with appropriate use of water reducers to get the workability we need, we can use limestone cements, we can add SEMs, and they will increase the strength, reduce permeability, reduce shrinkage, and improve sustainability of our concrete. We can make fairly substantial improvements, like the other 40 or 50 percent change in greenhouse gas emissions, just by doing simple things that are available today, but we're not necessarily taking advantage of. In fact, my, when my student was doing work, we did a bunch of other things, including using microfines. We were able to take a mix um, with um, 380 kgs of cement down to 95 kgs of cement, so 633 to 158 pounds per. per um, or to be guard, so it should be to be guard there, um, and get the same performance out of the concrete. Now, I haven't shown you all that stuff, but that's a whole other story. But just doing simple things without worrying about getting into microfines and that, we're able to get a huge change in the, in the greenhouse gas emissions or cement contents. In that. So, we can do a couple of things reduce the clinker content of the cementitious binder and reduce the total binder content. They're two separate issues. And we can do them using fairly simple things, as I said. So um, the biggest impediment is that nobody wants to put extra bins in their ready-mix plant for aggregates, which amazes me because you're paying $10 a ton for that stuff and $100 a ton for cement. The economy seemed kind of strange to me. But it's no different when we introduced slag in the 1970s in Ontario. Nobody wanted to put a second silo in for slag cement until the company that did it first all of a sudden was knocking the pants off everybody financially and all of a sudden everybody wanted a second bin because there was money to be made. Which I don't understand why people don't see the money in, in optimizing aggregations. The rest of the world does it. We're just pretty poor at it in North America for the most part. So that's it. Thank you.